So hello there guys and welcome back to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you guys are doing well. I hope you're staying safe as always. And here we are, launch week, or at least the first of two launch weeks in the F1 2023 season. The period that sometimes feels a little bit like Christmas for us F1 fans. It really starts to feel like the F1 season is about to begin. And this time, we will see our new challenges for 2023 take shape. We're going to discuss what they look like. We're going to discuss any sort of intricacies that we can see. Some of the uh, more anecdotal parts of launch week that we've seen so far or some amusing observations and of course we will also be discussing of the teams that we will be reviewing what we feel they need to improve for 2023 based on one or two ailments or issues that they may have had for 2022. Joining me on this episode as always Courtney Pine and Lee Wannington the DNF1 panel in full force to break down all of those talking points but of course guys as always thank you so much for supporting us on the channel very very close to 1000 subscribers now so of course if you are new to dnf1 hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on youtube and of course like the video as well it really does help us out a lot can we get to a thousand subscribers by at the start of the season it does seem likely but we need your support to get over the line and of course if you are listening to the show on your favorite audio platform give us a five star review it really does help us out a lot pleasantries out of the way courtney first it comes to you how are you doing mate and how have you enjoyed launch week so far? We've seen half the grid and uh, it's starting to take shape now, isn't it? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, yeah, to start a second, what you said about the uh, subscribers. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined the channel recently. Um, we've got plenty coming up, so do stick with us. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I've, I've, I've got my opinions on these uh, on these launches. and I want to sort of say the, the term launches with inverted commas because... I, I I just I just feel that these launches now are more of a corporate thing rather than, you know, an actual raw F1 thing. I understand why the teams don't want to show a lot. I fully understand that. But I, I've seen a lot of fans getting disappointed. But I think we have to accept these launches for what they are. And they are corporate events. Yeah. For some of these launches i remember in the past we always used to see the new car and perhaps this coincided with a time where social media wasn't really as uh how, how would i say it wasn't as commonly known or used as much as it is today and as a result certain you know details of the new cars wouldn't necessarily be easily circulated at least until the start of the season when we got underway as it is teams like to be a lot more secretive about what's under the hood or what's on the hood of some of their new challenges in this case. So I can totally understand why they'd want to hold their cards close to to their chest before the start of the season. There are a few which probably a little bit more disingenuous than others, but we will get into that momentarily. Lee, thanks again for coming on the show, as always, part of the panel now. Um, How are you doing, mate? Have you been enjoying launch week so far? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I've been enjoying it, as you said. It's the it's, we start to see the cogs come off the F1 winter season, and you're like, uh, F1 springs nearly in the air. Well, so is literal spring, but uh, uh, we're we're from the one channel, so that's the bit I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's been interesting seeing the 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 events. Um, as Courtney did mention, they're they're probably a bit more of a livery reveal than they used to be, or lack of livery reveal if you want to go the other way. Um, but yeah, it's uh, really nice to see that these cars, and I'm looking forward to discussing them. Yeah, well, in this episode, we're going to be discussing the five teams which we have seen in the first week. Now, of course, by the time that you listen to this show, you may have already seen the McLaren and the Aston Martin break cover on Monday night, maybe even the Ferrari that breaks cover on Tuesday. So, of course, we will talk about those next in the next episode. For this one, however, we're going to be discussing Haas, Red Bull, Williams, Alpha Tauri, and Alpha Romeo. Not necessarily then in that order, but just needed to remember as I went along that I got the right ones. So first, guys, let's talk about the first team that broke cover, sort of. Haas with the VF23. Now, as Courtney had already mentioned, that there were a few occasions that these some of these launches were a little bit disingenuous. Haas, to their credit, were up front when they unveiled their new livery on the 31st of January, the first team to do so for 2023. And a lot of it 
would obviously have been around their new corporate sponsor, MoneyGram. And, you know, first things first, you know, an opportunity for us to get more money into the team is obviously going to be a good it's a money grab. There you go. <laughs> first one already. Um, but as, yeah, as Lee pointed out, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, you know, get some added investment into this team, which I think we'd all agree is something that has have been missing before we talk about what Haas really need to improve on for 2023 or what we feel they need to focus on to have a good year what did you guys make of the car i mean the delivery itself i like it It reminds me of one of the uh i was gonna say Haas cars of old but they've only been around for a few years but it sort of reminds me of uh you know the sort of it around the the, the grosjean and uh was it grosjean and magnuson yeah, it would have been. It was, it? wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was around the, the Grosjean and um, Magnussen era hash. So it looks like they've gone back to their uh, their roots for delivery. But I think we can all agree that the black isn't just for the sake of being nostalgic and for, for the Haas team. I think it's to do more with the uh, trying to save weight. Because I've seen a bit of a common theme with these liveries so far. There seems to be more black on these cars or darker shades of blue than we're used to seeing. But yeah, I, I, I think Haas, you know, as you said, Adam, they pretty much said themselves that this isn't a 2023 car. I just think we just, with these launches, as I said before, look, we just need to accept that we are going to be seeing very little of the 2023 cars. We'll just have an idea of what the paint jobs look like. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's an important point. You mentioned about weight saving. And last season, one thing that did affect all of the teams not surprisingly, was the fact that they did struggle to shake the weight. I think Alfa Romeo were the only team yeah. that was able to make the weight, so much so that they actually had to increase the weight of their car because, of course, they wanted to keep the limit as it was. They ended up raising the limit because nine of the teams asked for it to be raised, so obviously helped them. And now we're starting to see some of these cars coming out with these new colour schemes, these more carbon fibre-based liveries, which... You know, it doesn't take a genius to know that's going to save weight and less weight on a Formula One car is a good thing. Obviously, that means more performance is going to be faster, more nimble in the corners. So a lot of the teams, as we've seen already, have gone down that route. And as you said, Courtney, this car does look pretty nice. I like the livery. I think it's a nice blend between what classic hash used to be, albeit that was only 2016. So I wouldn't exactly call that classic so much, but something between that and a little bit of the uh, the rich energy livery that we saw. Not so much the gold, but definitely the black element as well. And I must say, depending on what you what angle you look at this house, if you look at it from the front, it looks like a, a normal house. If you look at it from the side, it looks a bit different. But I must admit, it was a very, very good start. Of course, Haas did a shakedown run a couple of weeks later. I think it was um, on Saturday morning at Silverstone. Kevin Magnussen getting behind the wheel for the first time. Obviously good to uh, shake off the cobwebs, if you like, and get behind the wheel with a 2023 car. Um, Lee, what did you make of the car? Did you like the look of it? Uh, I did like the look of it. it does, as, you, as you both already mentioned, it does shake up the delivery from the last couple of years, which is refreshing to see. Um, obviously, some teams have their classic um, colour scheme, um, but obviously Haas doesn't have that kind of legacy. But it's still nice to see a, a different change up, although it, Unfortunately, it is to a darker car, and I know I mentioned it in the previous episode about I, I think there's going to be a trend for dark cars, and uh, I know we're only on Haas, but <laughs> there's a, there is definitely that trend already being um, foreseen this year. Um, but yeah, I really liked how it looked and the, the the shape of the car, um, and I mean for Kevin, obviously. He can. He could have uh, had a feel of it. How much he purposed or not? <laughs> <laughs> that was true, I suppose. But um, I mean, when we look at some of these cars, I think that is a theme we're going to see this season. And based on what we've seen already, a lot of the teams are going down that route. So it could well be the darkest looking grid that we've seen this mm-hmm. uh, in F one history. Um, maybe for some, may not be for everybody. I think we can all agree. I like a colourful grid. Um, but, you know, given the current constraints of the current rules, that may be a little bit more difficult to achieve than one would thought. It's amazing how much paint weighs after all. And, of course, uh, we saw that with Ferrari last season when, a season when they went with the matte finish and years before that to save a little bit of weight on their cars. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see once the whole grid takes shape how it's going to look. Thinking about what has need to improve next season, Lee, what would the first thing come to your mind when you think of what Haas would need to improve for 2023? 
So are we talking about the car in particular or the team overall? In terms of, well, in terms of the team and the car, I suppose, as a as an entity, really, in terms right. of their competitiveness. Well, the first thing is more speed, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, but we, we <laughs> can apply that to everybody, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so I want to get that joke out of the way. Um, I'm going to be serious now. Um, no, so obviously I think one of the big things as a, as a team that they need to improve, which is obviously been the signing of Nico Hulkenberg, is their ability at bringing back the points over compared to Mick Schumacher's crashing. Um, but as a car, or obviously minusing the speed, is it's going to be done the consistency that they can get the car over the season um obviously last year has started out relatively strongly but through the development race um they lost out and just went backwards so getting a consistent performance over the year and then just developing that car and hopefully it's a good baseline for the season out to the year now they've got a bit more funding um for their season yeah absolutely um courtney would you want to add on that or is there anything yeah. else in particular I think absolutely. I think uh, a sustained development charge throughout the season is going to be important for Haas because I do expect a sort of uh, a tight battle, shall we say, at the back between um, ha- obviously Haas, Williams and Alpha Tauri. So there's going to be sort of, you know, there's going to be like points and prize money up for grabs from, I'd say, 8th to 10th. So it is important that for Haas to sort of, if they see themselves you know, looking more towards the midfield than towards the bottom, they're going to have to sustain this the development of this car because that's definitely where they fell short last season. And I think that is going to come with an injection of more money. You know, when we're not just talking about money as well, you talk about people resources. I know they've got a base set up at Maranello. So obviously, whilst there's no partnership with Ferrari in that regard in terms of swapping information or helping each other out, there's always going to be an element where they will need to sustain their performance, but also take advantage of the car relative to its competition when it's in a position of strength. And last season, we saw that with Haas. We saw quite evidently that the best period for them in 2022 was the first few races of the season. And Kevin Magnussen took full advantage of that with some great results early on. Mick Schumacher took a little bit longer to get up to speed. And ultimately, I think what cost him a seat at the end of the season was the fact that he wasn't able to convert on chances that he had and kept crashing the car, which obviously isn't going to help with development. So I, I agree with both of you. I think there's going to be a sustained, there needs to be a sustained development from Haas. It may not necessarily come in the short term. So I think it will be important for them to be able to take advantage when they are in a position of strength. That is going to be the hard thing for them. And you know, the, the more I think about this, I think this is actually quite important with someone like Nico Hulkenberg, where I don't think any of us are expecting Hulkenberg to finally get that podium after all these years or anything crazy like that. But I think with him in that car, if he can get up to speed quite quickly, and I can't see any reason why that won't happen, he will be a reliable point scorer when Huss are in those positions. I mean, even Kevin Magnussen was throwing away some points uh, places towards the end of the season. So Huss do need that stability. And I think... Considering they finished eighth last year, I think we can all agree only Williams on average had a slower car than they did over all the races. So they did overperform a little bit. Their season is going to depend on whether or not they can replicate that or perhaps take more advantage of opportunities as and when they come. Oh, yeah, it's going to be very much down to the opportunities. And as we've seen with the cra- crazy races that we had last season, there will be races and having Nico Hulkenberg and Kevin and Magnussen, and they will be in a position to capitalize on that and make it count and as Courtney said it's probably gonna be a very tight battle at the back so they're gonna need to get those points yeah let's move on to the reigning defending world champions Red Bull unveiling what they called to be the RB19 it wasn't the RB19 let's be honest now um it was barely even a new livery I mean you know all jokes aside with Red Bull we knew what the car was going to look like Last season, when they unveiled what was considered to be their 2022 challenge of the RB18, it was pretty much the F122 show car with a Red Bull livery on it. So we kind of knew where Red Bull was going to go with this new unveiling. As it was, there was a big announcement of a new engine partnership with Ford, along with Red Bull powertrains. And of course, incidentally, Red Bull tried with the FIA to get Ford listed as a new engine supplier so they could have additional funding and resource for 2026. That was denied. So they're not going to get that luxury or go through that loophole. I think a lot of engine manufacturers would be very happy to hear that. But there was a big unveiling, not just for the car 
or the livery in this case, but also for Ford as a partnership. We saw a lot of people involved at Red Bull, not just people affiliated with the new, uh, with the F1 team. We saw people part of the Red Bull program from other sports. For me, it was a nice show, I suppose, on the stream that we saw, for those that were watching it. I think considering that the F1 fans were the main stakeholders or the main party interested in watching this, considering what we actually saw versus what was advertised to us, I don't like saying this, but I really felt let down by Red Bull. I felt it was basically, it was disingenuous, you know, that they pretty much told us it was going to be the new car. They didn't even say it was going to be a new livery. Not only was it not a new car and, or barely a new livery, basically flat out lied to the F1 fans, quite frankly. And I think whilst a lot of us expected that to be the case, it still is a bit disappointing. And I don't think, with you know, as big as the brand is or what you are, I really don't think you should be doing that. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being up front and saying, we're just going to unveil the new livery and do this. But yeah, well, I mean, what did you guys think of that? Um, I, I imagine you're you're probably going to be surprised to hear this, but I'm going to defend Red Bull on this one. Oof, wow. And I no, just I thought I see the get... day. I'm, I'm clipping <laughs> this. I am clipping this. Yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm just, just, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. I'm wondering that because of the you know the announcement surrounding Ford, because it is it's 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 a it's a big announcement. It's massive. I think it really sort of opens up the path as to where this sport's heading in in a few years' time. And I, I guess they wanted eyes, you know, eyes on screens, on phone screens, you know, on tablets, whatever you can think of. They wanted as many people to tune in for that announcement. And again, it ties back to my original point that these launches are more corporate than anything else. I do agree with what you're saying. It seems like there was a lot of waffle leading up to the actual reveal on the actual um, announcement. And that's that's definitely where I agree with you, Adam. I think I think there's too much waffle. There's there's too much, um, too many sort of corporate boxes that need to be ticked before we actually get down to what we've tuned in for. That does need to be looked at over again. But I just get the feeling that maybe Red Bull were doing this as a way to draw attention to the stream itself to, you know, obviously make the big announcement about Ford because we saw the leaks to, um, leaks through to the media. They were obviously done on purpose as well. It was a big market employer to get people to be around for the Ford announcement. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. And, and I accept that as well. And I understand that from a business perspective. I, I think... For me, I think what, what annoys me about the whole thing was, you know, first of all, the fact that it took like 45, 50 minutes before we even saw a car. I actually joked saying that you could actually watch the entire predictions episode that we did and still not miss the car from start to finish. And it turns out you could have done, really. And incidentally, if you want to, it's on the channel or on your favourite pop platform. If you haven't heard it already, there's some good ones in there. But Nicely plugged. Exactly. But um, my point is, is that... You know, from someone who, you know, I, when I produce these podcasts and put them out on YouTube or your favorite pod platform, and I put the titles and the descriptions and I describe what's going to be in the episode, what content we got, what you're about to be listening to. And of course, people click on that, or I assume they do, because they want to listen to the stuff that we talk about. And some of them find certain topics of interest a bit more than others. And obviously, if there is one like the 2023 predictions that has been doing really, really well at the moment. If I had advertised an episode saying that it was going to be an interview with Sir Lewis Hamilton and then you click on it thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to hear what Sir Lewis has to say. And it turns out it's just an interview with you guys, you know, with all due respect. That's <laughs> that's a, that's the same. It's kind of the same thing. It's like as much as as great as it is, you know, doing doing this thing with us right you guys aren't Sir Lewis Hamilton and our listeners are going to hear that and think well no <laughs> what what I'm saying is before I dig myself an even bigger hole than I already have done is that our listeners obviously if, if I promised them an interview with Sir Lewis mm. Hamilton and I just talk to you guys like any normal episode that we do they're going to be really annoyed at us over this and <laughs> with Red Bull is kind of the same thing to a degree they promised us a new car and we didn't even yeah. we didn't get that we didn't get we you know, we got a new livery, but it's Red Bull, so it's going to be the same looking car minus a few different things anyway. Um, and it was just to announce the Ford partnership, and that's fine. And even try to keep that secret. They wanted to try and that to be a surprise as well. So that's kind of my point. I just, mm. I just think from a brand perspective, or you know, using your your fan base or the F1 fans in general, I just think it's really, really bad just to get eyes on something that none of us would be interested in. Because if they told us what it was going to be, 
and followed suit. How many of us would have watched that? Would it just wait for the I, renders? I, I didn't watch anyway because I knew what it was going to be. Yeah, well, there, well, there you go. You're wiser than the rest of us. So, I mean, I know some people will probably come in the comments to say, oh, well, you know, Mercedes did this last year. They had a big production with Sky Sports. And then the car they put out wasn't even the car that they used in testing. It was a different car, you know, stuff like that. And I've, I, I, no, I agree. I agree. I, I'm kind of the opinion now when it comes to these launches, I think teams just have to be up front and say to us, yeah. look, it's going to be a livery launch or it, we're just going to sh show you some pictures and that's it. Like if you don't want to show your car or you want to announce a brand with another engine supply like Ford, which is obviously a big thing in America and, and Red Bull really want to capture that br branding and that marketability in the US, that's absolutely fine. Just don't lie to the fans and tell us that you're going to show us one thing and then don't. Uh, especially when you made us wait 50 minutes for it as well that i thought was a that you know i'm gonna get that one off um <laughs> off my chest because uh, i'm ranting at this point but um i mean playing devil's advocate here shall we uh do you like the look of the red bull yeah it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it looks like last year's car that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's what you can say from it it's funny that lee because it was last year's car <laughs> yeah. in case you didn't know well, i mean the livery as well I mean, no, well yeah i mean you spot, spot the difference. But I, I was uh, saying from the media images. Yeah, could you spot any difference between the twenty three release car and last year's car? Mm. I failed to see any difference. I mean, I didn't look close enough. Probably you could probably see some difference, but uh, the, it look. was very much the livery. Um, it looked all identical, at least to me. Bring back the cameo livery, and then I'll be like, yeah, that looks great. Yeah, they never. Well, they do. They did talk about those doodle liveries that they're going to do at yeah. the US race or something like that. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting thing, to see all those. The, the thing is, Adam, that I I completely and utterly agree with what you're saying. Look, I, I get it. Red Bull are the team to beat. I think we can all agree that we expect Red Bull to be the team to beat. So, in 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 theory, they have the most to hide. So we yeah. understand that they don't want to be showing things off, even if they got little tell telltale signs of the concept they're going with. But you're right, for them to broadcast it like we're actually going to see the 2023 car, I understand your annoyance, Adam. I completely understand. And, and I, that's what I said at the very beginning of this episode. I just think the teams need to sell it for what it is. And we have seen other teams since Red Bull without giving away anything you know, that we're going to talk about later on. I've, I've just preferred it when it's got straight to the point, half an hour, done. Yeah. You see, this is what the car's going to look like. This is the paint job for this year. Have a little chat with the drivers, see what they their, their hopes and dreams are for this season. That's what we're tuning in for. So you're right, Adam. If they were more sincere about that, if they said, oh, yeah, we're just going to show that this car's going to look like what it's looked like for the last 15 years, we're going to talk to a world champion and the number two driver in Sergio Perez. That's it. I completely agree. But you're right. It, it does sound like they sort of, uh, they milked it, didn't they? I think they, I think they milked it like a prize heifer. I think that's the right. best way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have preferred if they... They just called the um, Christian Horner, Max, and Sergio eat cake, and they just it's them eating cake. And then at the end, it's like, oh, you hear fools coming in. It's like, That's it, bam. I'm not. I'm not an advertising <laughs> yeah. specialist. We just watch them eat cake, and then they are fools here. That'd be a much more enjoyable thing to watch, at least for I'm, me. <laughs> I'm curious to know, Nick. Why did you say cake out of all things? I just, I, I was know, just it's... thinking. You get, the, you get the red ball. You roll it out, and then it's like that game show: is it real or cake, or something like that? And then just get a big yes! knife cutting through the car. There you go, Adam. and it's cake. There you go. I, I would, I would pay good money to see someone make a big Formula One car out of cake, and then just cut. That would be really. I probably wouldn't. I, I'll tell mm. you what, Adam. If we get to this time next year and Red Bull do that, you need to get yourself a good lawyer, mate. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd watch that launch. I'd watch that launch. Yeah, and yeah. I hope you clip this. Let's make a short out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when I have the time, I suppose. Um, but let's talk, you know, all jokes aside, we should probably talk about Red Bull, what they need to improve on for next season. I mean, let's be honest, it's probably not a lot, given how good that they were. I, you could argue that this is as strong as Red Bull has ever been. I suppose, not to bring the tone down a little bit, the passing of Dietrich Mateschitz, obviously, is going to impact them. It may not have impacted them too much last year, because it did happen quite late on, and by which time... They pretty much got both championships wrapped up if they hadn't already won them already. So, you know, I think a lot of people that remember Dietrich and his influence of Red Bull goes as far as pretty much allowing them to do what they need to do to be successful, just signing the checks. And 
you know, now that Red Bull are going to be under new management, I can't remember who it is, but I think there's like a few people involved rather than just Dietrich on his own. So there is the temptation there that under new management, they might want to try and shake things up or try and put their own influence on this team. I think for me, I think they've just got to leave it alone. Keep doing what they're doing. Just sign the checks. Let Red Bull go about their business. This team is as strong as it's probably ever been, certainly stronger than it was in the Sebastian Vettel era. And yeah, just keep doing what they're doing. I can't really think of what more to say. I suppose if I can highlight one thing, and that is probably Sergio Perez. Now, we talked about this in the predictions video. I don't want to rain on his parade or be that guy, but I just feel that if Red Bull are going to be as successful as they were last season, and I think it will be tough for them to do that, they need to make sure that Perez is as competitive as he can be. I think if he maintains the same level of performance relative to his teammate, I could easily see him being sixth out of the top three teams. And, you know, as a result, that could be a problem for Red Bull, especially in the season where they are going to have to maximise every opportunity that they have to be strong because, of course, at some point, they're going to have to mitigate development time caused by the cost cap sanctions from last season. So what do you guys think of, of that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, because if you have a look at the the three, like should we say, like the top three, I'd I'd say that you look at Ferrari and Mercedes, probably got the strongest driver lineups that we've seen for a very long time. I think even if you have a look back to, um, if you have a look back to like to when Mercedes had Lewis and Nico Rosberg, Ferrari, for example, they obviously in twenty fifteen they had. Sebastian Vettel, obviously we know Sebastian Vettel was still sort of in around his best around that, the start of his time at Ferrari, but we they his, his teammate was Kimi Raikkonen. No disrespect, but the Kimi Raikkonen, it wasn't the Kimi Raikkonen of old, the the, the flying thing that we saw in the um in the McLaren and during his first stint at Ferrari, it was on the beach for half the season. Kimi Raikkonen. Now you're looking at Carlos Sainz. We know that he can really change the club consistently we saw that last season and George Russell and Lewis Hamilton I think we all agree is probably the strongest driver lineup on the entire grid so my when I said I think we, again we agreed with the predictions that Red Bull I will probably get carried by Max I know it sounds harsh on Sergio Perez but you feel that if Red Bull are going to win this constructors championship it's going to be more down to the relative performance of the car compared to the competitors than what Sergio Perez will have to offer. And I do feel that Sergio Perez will still be annoyed by what happened last season. I just the, the dynamic between the drivers isn't going to be as harmonious as we've recently seen. Yeah, Red Bull are going to really have to manage that next season. And, you know, um, we, we say in the past with Red Bull that they'll keep their second driver in check if they want to stay in the team with options available. But... The only driver I can think of right now that could jump into that Red Bull seat is possibly Alex Albon. And even then, I'm not sure if he's ready to jump into that right quite yet. And, and more importantly, I think Red Bull probably feel there might be a possible other driver that isn't in their program right now that could get into that seat. Of course, we can speculate over to who that might be whilst we probably have an idea who I'm talking about here. But, this, you know, it, all of those elements don't necessarily make it easy for them to manage this situation with Perez. You know, there's plenty of options they can have, perhaps too many options that they could have at this point. So we'll have to wait and see. I mean, Lee, again, as we've already said, that's a dynamic that we're going to have to keep an eye on with Red Bull and Perez. How critical do you think that will be for Red Bull this season if they can keep Sergio Perez and carrying, getting him to carry on doing what he was doing last season, despite the fact that obviously he's still going to be a bit aggrieved over how the season ended between himself and Max Verstappen? I I, I think there's going to be a lot of coaching um, and hand-holding for Sergio, not that he's not a capable driver, which he is. Um, but as I've already alluded to in a, a previous episode, although I can't remember which one, it, I think for me it's going to be the turning point. It's going to be Monaco regarding what's going to potentially hit, could happen between Sergio and Max and if there's a potential crash in the wall for a key pole position and if it repeats itself or Max does it to Sergio... Whatever the rumours were said last, what occurred last year in Brazil, if it repeats or a similar circumstance occurs, then that could be gloves off for the teammates. So I think for me, that's where, it, if they get through cleanly through Monaco and there's no repercussions, there's no incidents, 
then I think Red Bull are going to be in a good position to keep their the team pairing throughout the season without any issues. But for me, the it's going to be all down to Monaco um, regarding how Sergio and Max go through this year. Yeah, no, I agree. Let's move on to Williams now. Williams P10 in 2022. So they can only go up in, in terms of the standings, at least. <laughs> They revealed their livery last week. Then they revealed the actual FW45 on Monday during the shakedown that Alex Albon was behind the wheel of. James Vowles, of course, formerly at Mercedes, will be starting on as team boss soon. I'm not sure if he started officially yet, but he will be very, very soon. What did you make of the Williams guys? Because I know a lot of people were hoping that Williams might do something similar to McLaren and adopt the new Golf livery on their car on a more permanent basis. But I'll be honest with you guys, despite that, I kind of like that Williams mm-hmm. have stuck to their newfound identity. I know it's something that Jos Capito wanted to introduce to the team last year. I liked it. I thought, you know, you can tweak it a little bit, but I felt like Williams needed to stick to something like that, get a bit of brand identity back, something that I think had been lost for a while, probably as much as a decade, really. So it's nice to see they've stuck to that. Um, what did you guys make of it? Did you enjoy it, or would you have rather seen them go for something like the duck egg golf livery that is so famous now? But I'll be honest with you guys, it's been a long time. Many F1 fans of our generation probably won't even remember that being a regular thing. No, it's certainly one of the uh, better-looking cars we're seeing. It's, it's, it's got the least black on it. I, I suppose Williams uh, probably... <laughs> They're probably going with the mindset of, look, we're probably going to be slow regardless. So it's going to be slow, but at least it looked good. I was, I was, maybe that's the uh, maybe that's the mindset they're going with this season. But no, it does. It, it, it's definitely one of the better looking cars this season. We saw like the sort of remarks made about the Duracell thing. I, I just see it more as like a little quirk along the chassis of the car. I, fi- I find it a, a little quirk more than something that sort of overtake. We've, we've seen some of these, you know, some of the advertisements completely take over delivery. If it was just like one big Duracell battery, maybe that's the way they could have just uh, shaved some weight off the car mm. by having the majority of the car black like a Duracell battery and a bit of copper at the back. Maybe they'll do that. Maybe they'll just completely undermine what I just said and uh, go with a complete battery car next season. But I like that. You know, little quirks yeah. like that. So I think that's quite a nice touch. It, it's something that when they announced that partnership with Duracell last year, a lot of us made the joke saying they should do that. I think they did it once, but this year, no, I, I, I kind of like that. So, you know, fair play to Williams. Uh, obviously, the Golf logo is included on the car, part of their partnership. It's obviously not a major partnership, hence why the car looks the way it does. But, um, no, I like it. Lee, what about you? You a fan of the new FW45? Yeah, I, I actually do like it. I think it's a it's it's most, one of the most colourful cars that we've seen so far, um, which is nice to see. All right, it's, it's still a, a, a dark blue, but it's still... Good to see colour, not grey, um, from the carbon fibre. Um, although there is obviously some exposed carbon, um, but it is, it's a really nice uh, looking car on a, on a, in the in the uh, get the word out, Lee. Um, on the paint job, it's not the word I was going for, but uh, livery. That's the one. Um, my mind went blank. Sorry. Um, but it is a nice livery. Um, and I do like how it looks, and I do agree with the brand identity. I I think it's very important that they're Williams trying to establish that, and obviously with the money coming into Formula 1 at the moment. Brand is everything in for a team in how it um, makes my extra money on top of the sponsorship and the revenue and being recognisable. And oh, uh, the golf livery was obviously before our time in being fans of Formula 1. And he obviously had that special um, comeback last year, McLaren. But I think it's much more important for Williams to, to keep this brand developing for this new modern day Williams um, and keep that on the, on the sport instead of um, going to someone else's brand, so to speak, um, which end of the day, it, the fans are, may buy some things, but the it may not sell as much, and especially as the younger fans are now getting more into the sport, it's it's not maybe as certain as it maybe been ten years ago if it happened. Um, so, but I do like it. Yeah, no, I like it too. And, you know, there's a large element of truth to this with golf. You know, I was listening to a show the other day and they were talking about this. And, you know, they made the point that, you know, one or two generations right now, you know, you've got Gen Z, even us millennials. You think of golf. Obviously, you remember the old Ford GT uh, and the liveries behind that car and some of the others that had that livery. And 
you know, you can't really think of it in terms of F1 terms other than what we saw in McLaren last year. So there is a huge gap in history where you just think that golf has always been a part of it, but it really hasn't. So I, I'm with you guys. I like this Williams. I think if they'd addressed it up in the dog, duck egg golf livery, yeah, it would look pretty cool. I'd probably got bored of it after a few races as a gimmick. I think it's great as a one-off and maybe we'll yeah. see Williams do that like McLaren did at Monaco. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. In terms of what they have to improve for 2023, it could just be as simple as what you said, Lee, go faster. But, um, you know, in, in terms of the team itself, James Val's coming in. I kind of want to kick this off with Williams and I just feel that what we learned from Jos Capito's tenure at the team, it's very disjointed at Williams. You know, there's a there's not a lot of synergy going on between the teams, not a lot of work in tandem with each other. You know, departments always competing more against each other rather than with each other. And, you know, as a result, I think one thing James Vowles is going to have to do at Williams is basically find out what makes everybody tick in all these different departments. Find within these silos what works, what they can do together, and just get everybody working on the same page right now. Because I think we've seen that for years at Williams, and there's always been delays in resources coming out. Uh, I think a couple of years ago when Paddy Lowe was running the show at Williams and, you know, the car wasn't even ready for three days in testing, which obviously was, it's criminal in Formula One when that sort of thing happens. You can't come back from that. And, you know, it's like last season, Williams, they went the wrong way on their concept. They had to start again and they were playing catch up, but they were already half a season behind everybody. So I think they really need to optim optimize their resource allocation as well on this as well, but um, and make the most of what they have really if they're going to move forward. Um, Courtney, what do you think Williams needs to improve on? I I've, I've, I don't want to go into Latifi bashing, but I do feel that having another a new driver in the team will make a difference. I just it, it did seem like obviously after losing George Russell, the team definitely stagnated. I, f I feel that George Russell was sort of like a beacon of hope for them, but they obviously knew it was going to end up going to Mercedes. So I think having having a fresh driver lineup would definitely help the team. Alex Albon has been an excellent addition. I think he also sort of he, he, he brings his own character to the team and also actually help bring exposure and perhaps more money because we, we've seen it with the likes of George Russell. But actually some of these younger drivers is sort of like look at Leclerc Albon, Russell and Norris. These are actually the type of drivers that are bringing new audiences into the sport. And I feel that Albon will bring that new support to Williams. So I feel that if Williams are going to sort of aim to slowly make their way up the grid again, I do feel that a bit, a bit of stability surrounding Alex Albon could be key to that. Yeah. And Lee, in addition to that, Logan Sargent, obviously going to be a big part of the team this season, getting his chance in F1, how important is it going to be for the team to make sure he gets up to speed? Because, of course, as, as much as we've already talked about the disjointedness with the Williams team and their departments and James Vowles having to get that working and understand it a bit better, it is going to be a two-car battle for them. And Logan Sargent will be up against an experienced driver in Alex Albon. He will have to perform straight away. There's not going to be much room for him trying to find his way. Right. With, with Logan, it's it's going to be very important to get it, it oh, as you said on get going straight away. But it could also be a, very much it could be a sink or swim that it comes too much being the pressure in the, the young driver at the back of the grid. But at the same time, a young driver at the back of the grid is a good place to grow if you've got the talent to grow off the radar. So it could go either way for him um, regarding how he's going to perform. Obviously, the first few races there'll be probably be some silly mistakes, but. That will apply to all. No, I say all the rookies. It, but anyway, I'd probably say all the rookies. Even um, Nick DeVry will probably make some silly mistakes, experienced as he is. But um, there will be some silly mistakes. But hopefully, those will be ironed out by the time you reach the European uh, leg of the season. Um, and even from James's part, obviously coming across the silos and getting experience as a team principal um, would be great if you can harmonise Williams. But you just to uh, put it out there of if he's there long term at Williams and he gets Williams into shape and Toto Wolf retires, well, will his Mercedes links uh, come calling? Um, is this a uh, Mercedes uh, in training for him to take over from Toto? Toto? Toto. Um, just a, a, a thought to put out there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not a bad idea. 
I think whatever happens at Williams, it's not going to happen overnight. And this is a project that I think they've got a young team principal in who may not necessarily have been the marquee signing that they may have been hoping for, but this is someone that wants to make their way in that capacity. And I have the utmost faith that James can do a good job there. But of course, he has to find out the inner workings of the team. He has to try and get them all working on the same page. This is going to be a marathon, certainly not a sprint, no pun intended, of course. And we'll have to wait and see what Williams do. If they want to return to be a serious contender again and maybe move up the midfield in the short term, it's probably going to be a few years in the making. So there's going to be more pain ahead for Williams. But let's hope for their sake that there are going to be some tangible gains. I don't want to see them falling further behind. Let's move on to Alfa Romeo. The C43. Now, of course, P6 in 2022. i got to say, guys, the launch itself was very reminiscent of something from the Jeremy Carl show. For those of you in the UK will know exactly what I'm talking about. It was quite meme-worthy, I must say. Um, Tom Clarkson, obviously presenting, did a great job, as he always does. And this is a team that is moving into a bit of an interim period now, in the same way that we saw with Aston Martin, but not necessarily on a scale as grand as theirs. They had their shakedown in Catalonia. It's going to be their first season without Fred Vasseur. Looking at the positives, the car looks phenomenal. Like I know we talked about a lot of black cars on the grid this season. I think that's going to be a, a bit of a trend. But I've got to say, Alfa Romeo, a team that are very often attributed to making a beautiful looking car, and they've done it again. Absolutely stunning car. I mean, what did you guys make of it? Yeah, but you, I agree. It is, it is a good livery. I, I did like the uh, the the white and red um, Alfa Romeo myself, but I do agree. It, it, it's Again, it's one of the better looking cars. Probably utilise the, uh, the weight saving more than some of the other teams that we've seen. So, you know, well done to them for that. But I think for Alfa Romeo... Like I'm, I'm very, very vocal on how, how bland I feel the team is in general. So I'm more keen to see them take step forwards. We, we spoke about, you know, Haas developing more, you know, throughout the season. We saw with uh, with Alfa Romeo, we saw them develop a, a good car to start with, sort of um, have a have a 9, 10 race break when it comes to... Uh, development and I thought oh bloody hell these other teams are starting to catch up now we'll uh, we just have to do a, a couple more upgrades just to uh, see us finish 11th and 12th every race but I think that that's the thing I just I just want to see more from this team because I agree the deliveries are good I'm always going to have a soft spot for Valtteri Bottas I like the way that Zhou Guan Yu settled into the team but the performance itself from the car is for me it, they're, they're like the rice cake of Formula 1 they are, they are they're, they're rice cakes <laughs> wow well i mean if looks can tell a story of the team they're going to be far from rice cakes this season but i totally get what you mean um i mean we'll talk about what the team needs to work on for 2023 in a minute lee what did you make of the new car are you a fan of how it looks yeah i mean out of the cars we've seen it is my favorite looking car for so far um it's williams is prettier pretty but the afro Romero is prettier um, and one thing that really got my attention in the reveal um, or the, was the the floor edge, uh, their serrated floor edge. Obviously, mm. when they did their shakedown, they didn't have it. So it, it was that something that they they tried to confuse the media, confuse other teams by, oh, look at our invention. Is it invention? And do we actually, or are they just mm -hmm. going a basic running? But even if it's a, a, a false flag and they're not actually doing anything with it um, or plan to do anything with it, it's still nice to see that they've gone to the effort to do a false flag if it's a false flag or if it's an actual innovation that they plan to run in testing or come to racing. That's very interesting. I'd like to see how that would do. So that's the out of all the teams that have been released so far, it's the first sign of a innovation or false flag that really makes it talking not just a bland livery reveal as we've seen on most of the other teams. So that's what really interests me about that launch. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of change with Alfa Romeo this season. I, I feel like the livery may also be a bit of a homage to the transition that they're going through to becoming Audi fully in 2026. And of course, that kind of starts now to a degree. They've got Andreas Seidel in, who's very much going to be operating in the capacity of the Audi perspective rather than being the team principal. He's not going to be doing that 
this season. He probably might be there for advice, but he's very much overseeing this transition into Audi, which is going to take place over the next few seasons. So perhaps the livery is a bit of a, you know, signage towards that, if you like. The team started off well last season. You know, they, they got some big points, particularly Valtteri Bottas early on in the season. They did drop off quite a lot as the season progressed on. I think before the Canadian Grand Prix, which was only the ninth race of the season, they scored 51 points. Rest of the season, four points after that. They can't really be doing that again. And the team often complained about difficulties with turnaround and getting designed, manufactured for upgrades and to put on the car. Investment is going to have to be made with the team going forward. Now, of course, they are going to be committing to putting more investment into this project. I'm sure Audi is going to be involved in that too. So that's obviously quite a big step forward. Yeah, they're at their budget cap this year. Yeah, which is a big thing for them. Getting personnel in is also a thing. I think we often talk about having the money for development parts and this, that and everything else. We don't talk about the personnel and that's something that Al, well, not Audi, but Alfa Romeo and Salva have struggled for a long, long time. So, to get more people in is going to be a good thing for them. It will allow them to keep up in the development race. Um, I mean, last year's car was quite good as well. It was good in low speeds. And we saw that, you know, in Monaco and a few other races early on where it was doing quite good. It did struggle with a lot of instability in the rear and high speed corners. They are going to have to improve reliability as well. Uh, I think it was like 10 retirements in 2022. I think it was more than any other team. And uh, it's not always about the engine as well. I know people will say, oh, well, you know, they had a Ferrari engine, so they probably were to blame for that. But sometimes how a team incorporates the engine into their car and gearbox can obviously play a factor too. It's not as simple as saying, oh, the engine's rubbish, therefore the car is going to suffer for it. So there's a lot to be done there. They've also got to manage the expansion project as well. Um, you know, that they're going to be expanding like Aston Martin are at the moment, although Aston Martin is certainly a lot further along this process right now than Alfa Romeo are before they become Audi. So there's a lot going on there. I suppose with all that being said, this is going to be a very hard task for Alfa Romeo to maintain P6 in the Constructors' Championship. I feel like they're going to be looking more over their shoulder this season rather than looking forward. Um, I mean, what do you guys have to say to all of that? Would you agree with that? Is there anything you want to add in terms of what they need to do for 2023? No, I I agree. Um, if if they want to, as you said, that if they want to have a smooth transition, they might have to take some pain before they make some gains. Because I you you do get the feeling that Audi will want to sort of push on right away. So they might want to do something similar to what Mercedes did and sort of you know have a couple sort of uh, four seasons and to think about the long term. So. I, I, I agree, Adam. I do expect that to happen. And yeah, you have a look at some of the other projects that are going on with these midfield teams. I think it's going to be difficult for them to keep up with these other projects. Yeah, I mean, I think we often underestimate how hard it is for some of these midfield te teams to try and make that step forward. I mean, Alpine are trying to do it when they've already got the facilities that they need. It's not as easy as it seems. McLaren, obviously like a sleeping giant, we're just waiting for that one to sort of turn into something. Um, and then you've got Aston Martin trying to grow and, and Alfa Romeo via Audi are going to be trying to do the same things. And, you know, Williams, of course, we should never forget them because they're trying to get back to where they once were many years ago. But it's not as straightforward as that. So with all that being said, it's really competitive in the midfield right now. And I suppose, Lee, if you offered Alfa Romeo P6, they'd probably take it for 2023. I think they probably would take it um, because it... I have all the news, um, right, we haven't seen the Aston Mine yet, but all the news coming out of the Aston Mine camp is going to be, it should be a brilliant car. Obviously saying it and actually being it is a different matter. Well, they said that last but, year. Yeah, true. But Aston Martin finished P7 and obviously they're going to be aiming for um, that P4 spot at least. So as you said, they're going to be looking after that shoulder because that Aston Martin are going to be coming on strong or trying the hardest to get at least, obviously they say P4, but they'll be aiming for at least that P6. Um, so it is... They really need that strong season. And, and as Courtney already alluded to, it's the development, again, maintaining over the season. All right, yes, they've got the, the full budget cap, so they may be able to do it. As already really mentioned, they may be able to do it. But being able to do it and then actually knowing how to do it is a different thing. And as you said, their staff, I mean, the staff to maintain it or have the idea. So just how because they have the money doesn't mean it can actually, they actually will do it. Um, but... I'm really looking forward to this mid-season battle this year. I really think it's going to be such a juicy fight, regardless yeah. of what happens at the front. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. If anything, it could be the highlight of the season, depending on how things go, whoever gets that P4 spot. Let's move on to the final team, the final reveal for the first week of launch week. Alpha Tauri, the AT04, revealed again on Saturday, the 11th of February. This one certainly raised a few eyebrows. I think a lot of us expected the Alpha Tauri to be quite similar to the color scheme that we've seen of them the last few years when they've unveiled their new car. And uh, yeah, a lot more red, a lot darker this car. It's following the same sort of line of thinking as other teams are in terms of design schemes as well. This one's a bit more controversial though, wasn't it? Some people like it, some people not so much. Courtney, you a fan of this one or not? Uh, not really. I, I feel like I've been a, a, ne- a negative Nelly on this one. I, I do. I just, I just, it just it looks like an F2 car. Like, do, do you remember what was the the F two, uh, uh, F two team? There was a Russian driver, and he and he always he was always sort of finishing in around the podiums. If anyone knows in the comments, please let me know. But it just reminded me of the team that he drove for. Oh, there's it's a gonna, few. I can see you ticking there. There's Adam. a I can few. See you I'm thinking there. of. There's, there's not really any bells for me. Oh, was it you talking about um, Markalov? That's it. That's King it. of the what tires. Was the team he drove for. Oh, uh, I wasn't like high tech or something like that, or ART. And it was, it was, is that kind of livery? It just it, it looks like like a, a midfield F two team, and, and I don't mm. know, like the livery just sort of like sums up where they are as a team at the moment. The sort of down in the dungeons, not really setting the world alight, you know. And, and I don't know, like for, for for a team that sort of like comes from like a, a fashion brand, you you think they'd be focusing on a good livery, but. It seems they've uh, they've had their creative juices limited limited by their new uh, sponsorship, I guess. Yeah, sponsorship with Orlen, obviously moving over from Alfa Romeo into the Alfa Tauri team. Not sure if that means we're going to see Robert Kubica turn up for preseason testing or any practice runs. We'll have to wait and see. Nothing's been announced at this point in time. Um, yeah, I kind of agree to an, an extent with this Alfa Tauri. I I I liked the the design scheme that they had before i thought it was one of the nicer looking cars in the grid i agree i wouldn't have mind something a little bit different don't think this was it and i suppose this kind of ties into what we say about red bull we always want to see something different with them and you know this is kind of a case of be careful what you wish for because they might produce something new and then all of a sudden we're like oh god i don't like that but um yeah we'll have to wait and see yeah. lee what are your thoughts on the avatari um did you like it at least afraid no i, I no. didn't i wasn't a fan of it i really wasn't um yeah, as you said it's you wished for, you won that slightly changed slightly refresh but the refresh doesn't look appealing at least to me and obviously in your opinions but it's, it's our opinion other people do like it um obviously everyone has their preferences on, on the designs and color schemes um but i had to wait and see how much because we talked about in previous episodes if they will copy Red Bull design a bit more because their last year's card was a bit of a dud. Um, it's obviously too early to say if they've copied any Red Bull designs. Um, but yeah, the, the car just doesn't just doesn't look appealing. <laughs> no, I don't know if it's the no. color scheme or it's just badly designed. I'm sure it's not badly designed, but yeah, like because I, I really... thought when, when I saw it, I, I thought, is it just me? Am I going mad? Because I saw the reactions online and it was sort of like. The internet version of wolf whistling. They were, they were wolf whistling this car. And I think is it is it just me? Because oh, I, I I just think this this looks average as average at best. Yeah, you know, people sort of reacting to it like it was like I don't know, like the black Mercedes. You know, the whole reaction to that. But you know, I, mm. I, I don't know. It, each to their own. But I I, I I I thought it was just me. But I'm glad that you two agree because we haven't really spoken about this in detail until now and. At least I'm not going crazy. Well, well let's I just wait till we see the black Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's going to be a trend for the season, isn't it? Um, no, no, no. I, I get what you mean, Corny. Um, on the DNF1 page, I just put, because I, I run that on Twitter and I just put, oh, hello. Like, you know, it's like a nice thing. But um, deep down, I was like, not feeling it. Really not feeling <laughs> with this car. Not a fan. But um, it, it might look better out in daylight. We've only seen renders, of yeah. course. And, you know, we Which often, isn't a true reflection. No, exa- exactly. And we often feel that with some of these new cars that look so much better out in daylight and sometimes under the night sky with the lights on them than they do in renders. And the Alfa Romeo was a great testament to that because that looked even better 
when uh, Joe Guan Yu did his shakedown at Catalonia. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, maybe they might change things. If they, you know, I probably won't, to be honest. But uh, hopefully, even though it's not the prettiest looking car on the grid, it might be a lot faster than what we saw last season. Um, looking back on 2022, it was a tough year for Alpha Tauri. Didn't really make the most of the package they had. I don't think it was as cut and dry as saying they had the ninth fastest car on the grid because they didn't. I think that you could argue they probably had the seventh fastest car on the grid if you average it out over the course of the season. But a combination of driver errors from Gasly and Sonoda, uh, both drivers were complaining that the car just wasn't responding well to them. And also the team not taking advantage of opportunities like Monaco. You know, that crazy race, it was good in low-speed corners, probably could have been best of the rest, maybe even a podium for Pierre Gasly that race. But because the team struggled to get him out in time during that red flag session, it really cost them. So if I was to lay down what I think Alpha Tauri need to do next season, obviously other than the obviously, which is uh, build a faster car, I think they need to take more chances when they come to them and be better at executing the opportunities when they come to them. Oh yeah, you have to think back on all right, the different name team, but um, Pierre's win. Um, I think it was Toro Rosso at the time, wasn't it? No, it was still Alpha Tauri. Yeah, it was still oh, Alpha Tauri. Yeah. But in the Toro Rosso for Sebastian Vettel, same track again. It's taking advantage of the conditions and the circumstances, and you just, as you said, you didn't feel they had that um, last year. So it'd be really nice as a team if they can recapture that. Um, magic that they had when the circumstances came that way, they could take advantage of it. And I, I, I do th- agree with you. I think that's the the really big thing that they need to try and regain. I don't know how they've lost it. Maybe it was just a bad year and they've just lost their confidence in themselves. But it would really be nice to see if they can regain that initiative and just take it when an uh, uh, opportunity comes. Yeah, very, very true. Um, I mean, the big dynamic for them this year is going to be having a new driver in Nick De Vries, someone that's obviously going to be very eager to perform after losing Pierre Gasly. And Yuki Tsunoda, in his third season now in Formula 1, he's had moments when he's been pretty good, but he's often lacked that consistency. Courtney, I suppose we've got to look at the drivers as well when it, we talk about Alpha Tauri. If Alpha Tauri are going to go anywhere this season, their drivers have to be on their A game majority of the time to maximise those opportunities that they didn't really do last season. Yeah, I, I think naturally the team will probably look at Yuki Tsunoda as you know the guy they're hoping that will get the results for them. But I think it's gonna. I feel it's gonna be Nick De Vries. I think from what we've seen it throughout um, Nick's career so far, he's very he's very a, very able to adapt quickly to any changes. He, he's done the job in multiple series. He's done the job with multiple teams. We saw last season, even in a short period, it was with those teams, whether it be a practice session or the race that he obviously did, the solo race he did for Williams. We're seeing that this guy is able to adapt quickly and he's he's definitely a competent driver. So I think he's going to be the guy that will get the results for this team when they need them most. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I... Yeah, sorry, Lee, go on. No, I was just going to say on Nick DeVry that you also think that he's going to have a lot of his uh, fan base already at most of the races, especially in the European season. The Orange Army <laughs> there for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... I thought they were there for Lando Norris. The situation of being sharing Max's nationality, but having such big fan bases there, it could be a big deciding factor through the the middle of the season, which could be a really key point of building Nick's confidence. Yeah, I think that's something we don't often see enough of in F1, more orange flares and fireworks. (laughs) But uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, Lando Norris said they were there for him. So uh, yeah, I'm sure Nick DeVries can capitalise on that. It's going to be a big year for him. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how he does and a big year for Alpha Tauri as well hopefully for their sake they uh take more chances this season because as we saw in this championship you really have to maximize the opportunities when they come i think that's all we've got time for in this one guys let us know those of you wonderful lot listening in and watching us on your favorite podcasting platform or youtube program there's only one don't know why i said it like that anyway look hope you enjoyed the episode let us know what you think of these new cars and of course add your own comments as well to Uh, regarding what you think each of those teams that we've talked about in this episode need to improve for 2023. Let us know which of the liveries you like and, of course, which of those that you're not a fan on. In the next episode, we are going to be talking about the remaining teams, McLaren, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Mercedes, and, last but not least, Alpine. 
Peen. But until next time, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Please stay safe and we will see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. And remember, as always, if you're not first, you're probably DNF1. Take care. See you soon. Goodbye. Good morning.